Hello and welcome to this fourth video in the series looking at macros where we're going to look at using macros to process audio and also the ability for macros to call other macros which makes them even more powerful. So, so far what we've been looking at mostly has been uh, MIDI based macros because the keyboard shortcuts and the straightforward editing with uh, no options is really what a lot of the MIDI stuff is about. Working with audio can involve more variables, should we say, so it's, it's a little more difficult in some ways to program some things, but there can be tasks that you can do which will still speed up your workflow. So quite often I get projects which uh, change considerably in complexity and clients want to add more and more uh, audio samples, etc., in as we go along. And I'm usually fairly uh, precise about what I do with the audio. So I tend to process the samples by putting a tiny little fade in at the beginning and a fade out at the end just to start off with. So we make sure if anything gets missed or, you know, you're not going to have any clicks and this, that and the other. Um, I'm just going to show an example of a macro for doing this kind of thing just to expand your understanding of what you can do with a macro. And say with audio, it can be a little more difficult because a lot of the things that we do involve precise mouse movement so for instance doing a fade it's difficult to communicate to the macro system that you want to do a fade of a certain length so we have to work around those kind of things but with some practice you can come up with all sorts of stuff that will save you hours and hours let's say if you were just going to import all of your samples at the beginning of a project you could do that by selecting all and then putting on your little fade ins and your fade outs and any processing you want to do. But that's not normally the way that projects work. It's you import a few things and then do some other stuff and then do some more and so on. So having to do it at a piecemeal can get a little long winded. So we're just going to look at doing something to this. So all we're going to do is put a little fade in at the beginning and a longer fade in, sorry, fade out on the end. As ever, we're going to go to key commands window and then show macros. So we're just going to call this one process imported audio. And first thing we're going to do is use the transport locators to selection command, which is obviously one of the greatest keyboard shortcuts of all time, P. Um, so that's going to be the first thing we do. So once we, before we trigger this macro, we're going to click on the thing we want to apply this processing to and then this will move our locators and the reason we're using the locators is they allow us to then concentrate uh, what's going to happen very quickly and easily so first thing we do is add that and then we're going to move the position to the left locator so we do go to left search for that and we can see again another one of the greatest shortcuts of all time num1 which takes you to the left locator so we're going to add that in now, what we're going to do is just put in a very small movement of the transport to allow us to do a fade. And that is classified as a nudge. Okay, now you see we've got a few options here. So we're just going to nudge plus one frame. So that's a 25th or a 30th of a second, depending on what your settings are in Cubase. So we're going to add that. And then the last thing we're going to do is actually do our fade, which is a fade into cursor. So fade into cursor there. So that will then fade between the beginning of the audio and that one frame later current position. So that's the fade in done. Now the fade out is going to be done in a similar way, but we're going to use the right locator. So that would be the num2 again one of the greatest keyboard shortcuts uh, to misquote Kanye West but um, yeah it's not as great as num1 obviously but useful sometimes um, so we're going to go to the right locator there and then we are going to nudge the cursor to the left or use the bars so if we look again at nudge what we could do is you could put in a bunch of frames to the left so if you wanted a one second long one, you'd put in 25 or 30 or whatever frames. The other option you see is bar. Now, it's it's easy to think this will be, well, that'll be one bar less, but actually it's to the nearest bar to the left, so it's slightly annoying, but we'll just go with that for the time being. So we're just going to add that, and then just like before, we're going to fade out to cursor. 
So let's just find that. And there's fade out to cursor, and we're going to add that in as our last command. So if we do that, we click on this, and you'll see that when we apply that under edit and macros, we get that. So at the very beginning, I'll just zoom in so you can see. Got a little fade in already done. And at the end, we've got that fade out, but it's done it to that bar. So it looks like it's a bar long, but that's purely because of where the end of this was. If I undo what it did and take it over the bar line and then do that same process again, you can see that it just does it to bar 11. So you've got to watch that. It's not perfect. It would be much better if we could say, you know, add a five second fade or whatever, but we don't get that option just yet. So that's one thing we can do. Now, the other thing is to show you that macros can call other macros. So in the previous video, we had uh, a macro which I called offbeat base, which basically muted one event and then moved on to two events later and then muted that and so on. Now, that can be used on audio as well, which may surprise you. But because it was events, Cubase just treats events as events. It doesn't really care whether they're audio or MIDI or what. So what we're going to do is we're going to chop this up into sixteenths. So there's our sixteenth. Again, out and click. And there we go. And going to give it that kind of chopped up sound by applying our macro. Now, that's under here. And we'd also done it as a keyboard shortcut of Alt-Shift-M. And you can see it's done that. And then I can carry on doing that so two three four five six seven eight times and now we've got something which is chopped up and sounds suitably odd the kind of thing that would take you a while to do normally now what we're going to do is we can combine that macro into another macro but also bounce that down to a new audio file so this example is again as ever under there so i'm going to call this mute and bounce sample oh excuse me wrong place all right mute and bounce sample now we're going to add that macro to it so under All the commands here we've got offbeat base which is a command that now this macro can call so macros can call other macros and then can then in turn call other ones so we're going to add that and we're going to do that eight times because that's how many is needed for those 16ths that we've cut it up into now the next thing we're going to do is select everything on that tract so and it's select all on track. So because we'll have that track selected, it will select everything on that track, which is what we want. So we're going to add that. And the final one is going to be bounce selection. And that will then bounce that down to a new audio track. So that's going to do all of that in one go. So all we need to do is click on that first one. And then under macros, mute and bounce sample there. You can see it's done it already and then we are going to replace that and there it is done so if you've got anything like that which uh, uses another macro you can do that and then importantly with audio ones you can make it select everything on that track and then bounce it down to a new track so you don't end up with you know a laundry list of little regions so obviously once you're happy with it you don't want to have loads of these to handle because when you're zoomed in, it's one thing, but when you're zoomed out, it's it's difficult to play around with these. And while you can put them in parts, um, I'm not the hugest fan of parts for reasons of usability. They have their uses, but they also can be a little bit frustrating in terms of using them. So there you go. That's uh, the fourth and, at the moment, final video in the macro series. So hopefully that's taking you through the idea of what macros are and giving you an idea of what you can do with them. Now, it's an almost unlimited set of things you can do because there are thousands as you can see here there are literally thousands of different commands in cubase and each of them can be called now some of them aren't so friendly so for instance if you go to the uh, process section here uh, things such as normalize which in fact we will just 
just do a quick demo of. So let's just add normalize in here and let's call that not great because it's not always great. And let's uh, put normalize in. Okay, so if we add normalize in there and then do that on that. Oh, excuse me. Mouse error. Right, so you can see there it's done that. Now, depending on what's happened previously, Normalize will inherit your previous settings. So you can't just set that Normalize must set it to, let's say, minus six or zero or whatever. You have to go with this and then adjust the dialog box accordingly, which can, um, well, it it's limits how useful it is because obviously you might want a preset to do that. And when you're importing audio files, you might want everything to be set to minus six dB. And it doesn't work like that with Normalize or any of the other uh, presets where you've got anything to change. Any of the processes where it's just a straight process, you can add it and it will just do it. But it's slightly less... Um, slightly more useful now rather now it's got a direct offline processing because then you can change it and the other things will will follow and alter but it's not a complete control solution just yet but it still could be useful to you but there are so many different uh, options that you can take you say under key commands just have a look through there'll be all sorts of things and it's often it's a good idea just to go oh what does that do and then either look it up in the manual or have a play with it and see what it does and you might find your, you know, your new best friend. But macros are really, really useful, as I've said many times throughout this series. They're so useful for just improving your workflow, and it's your workflow. So you will want to do different things to anybody else because it will work around the way that you, in particular, work. So if you end up doing, you know, the same kind of ideas again and again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But let's try and make it so you can do them quickly and easily with two presses of buttons on the keyboard rather than three minutes of frantic mouse movement. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this series and if you have, please consider subscribing.